Hi, everyone. This is Guy Snodgrass. I'm a retired U.S. Navy commander, former Top Gun instructor, FA-18 fighter pilot, and I'm stepping into the, uh, was it Spotlight? <laughs> yeah. I'll start right. over from the top. <laughs> the spotlight on the veteran crowd network. Yeah, I got it. Right up hey. to the point where you screwed it up. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know we had it. All right. So that was a, that was a good first uh, blush. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Guy Snodgrass. I'm a retired U.S. Navy commander, fighter pilot, former Top Gun instructor, speechwriter to Secretary James Mattis, and I'm stepping into the spotlight on the veteran crowd network. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, this is your host, Bob Lalvin, and this is the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. I'm very pleased to have today. Uh, gosh, I mean, I, I tell you, I'm excited about this one. I'm getting goosebumps, uh, getting ready to talk with Guy Snodgrass. He's a native of Colleyville, Texas, a U.S. Naval Academy grad, class 1998. And as he said, he's a former Top Gun instructor. He wrote speeches for Secretary Mattis. Uh, he's got uh, 2,784 total flight hours and uh, 719 successful carrier landers, landings. And he's the author of a book called Top Guns Top 10 Leadership Lessons from the Cockpit. Guy, thank you for stepping into the spotlight. Yeah, thanks, Bob. It's great to be with you. And thanks for having me on the Veteran Crowd Network. I am, I, I, I tell you, I, I am so disappointed that the Maverick movie got delayed because of COVID. It might be my biggest uh, biggest disappointment uh, as a result of the pandemic that they pushed the release back a year. Um, but boy, I I just really excited to to have you here today. I, I like to start though and and go back in history a little bit. Tell us about uh, growing up in Texas and how you wound up choosing the Naval Academy. Have you always wanted to fly? Sure. No, that's a great question. And I'm going to join you in that sentiment that that's definitely one of my bigger disappointments for 2020. Like you, I was really looking forward to the uh, sequel to Top Gun, Top Gun Maverick, and I'm looking forward to it next summer. So hopefully that one remains on track for July 2021. Let's get all the bad stuff out of the way in 2020. We might as well just lop right. it all in. Right. Yeah, it's already it's already happened. Let's rip the Band-Aid off and, and move forward into a brand new year. But uh, you know, it's a great question. I, you know, it, it really is truly kind of a cliche. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, I saw the first Top Gun movie. Uh, it had been out for a few years. It, you know, there were some scenes in it that my parents thought were a little bit beyond my, my age at 10 and 11. But I saw it when I was a teenager, uh, fell in love with it, thought it was just a, a it romanticized naval aviation, uh, being a fighter pilot. And I also had the kind of secondary benefit of being a Boy Scout in North Texas was very much involved with that program. And, and every summer we would go to, there's an air, airport here called Alliance Airport. And we would go and we would do our annual Boy Scout fundraisers there. They'd have the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds flying overhead. You know, the, of course the whole airport's filled with military airplanes. And so I'd walk around and just be mesmerized by them. So I think that's where my early love for aviation came into play. You know, kind of toyed with the idea up until the point I was maybe towards the tail end of high school. And then I just, jumped on this idea that I really wanted to go to one of the service academies. And so I kind of put the pedal down and, and focused on my grades and was able to successfully make that happen. Did you apply also to the Air Force Academy in West Point? I did. I applied to uh, each of the academies. I applied to Air Force, to West Point, to the Naval Academy, and also to the Coast Guard Academy. Ah, interesting. So, so you wind up there and... Um, uh, how was the experience, I guess, in Annapolis? There are worse places to go to school, I guess. Yeah, there's definitely worse places to go to school. I mean, three and a half years in Annapolis, I actually got selected for a real fun program. They, it's like a prisoner swap um, where you get to go to another service academy for six months. So I went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs for one semester. My first semester of my junior year of college uh, was in Colorado Springs. So got a chance they do to do a prisoner me. exchange during the football game. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when Navy came to Colorado Springs, They'd march us, uh, both groups on the field and they'd swap the Air Force and the Navy players back and forth. So I got to sit with the Navy team during the, uh, the actual game. But I mean, great experience overall. Um, definitely you had your head down, you're working hard. And it was funny, I'll never forget when I was a senior at the Naval Academy and I'm walking across campus. I remember looking up and seeing an inscription on one of the historic buildings and thinking, when did they add that? You know, and it was one of those things where you just realized you'd had your head down 
running hard. Of course, the inscription had always been there. I just never saw it. So I'll never give up the ship, uh, something like that. Right, exactly. You know, so I mean, it's one of those things where uh, just a, a historic campus and a beautiful part of the country and and the town there, of course, really embraces the uh, the Naval Academy. Got the aviation selection, head to Pensacola, maybe? Is that where the first stop for you? Or did you go somewhere else? It was actually else? my second stop. I was real lucky. I also had a chance to, when I graduated, they'll take 15 members of the graduating class. I'll let you go straight to get a master's degree. And so I got picked up for that program. I went up to MIT for a couple of years, uh, got a couple of master's degrees, and then went to Pensacola, like you mentioned. And then I was off and running on my aviation career. And then the third stop was Florabama then, I guess, there in Pensacola, <laughs> right? That's right. You're picking up uh, definitely one of the more famous if, if places you've never everyone visited to hang out. Pensacola and you've never been to Florabama, it's a, it's a bucket list, uh, trust me. Um, I, I, uh, I'm a big fan, a big fan. So you go through Pensacola and you get into uh, the fleet and you get into the F-18, right? Yeah, sure do. So uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll find yourself kind of hopscotch around America. I started off in Pensacola. I did what they call undergraduate pilot training. My very first stop was actually with the Air Force at Enid Air Force Base in Oklahoma. Um, did about a year there learning just the basics of flying. And then I got selected for jets. So I went to Meridian, Mississippi, uh, did some more advanced training and subsequently got selected for F-18s. Found myself in the Central Valley in Lemoore, California. And uh, that's where I learned to fly the F-18. And then my first tour of duty took me across the country to Virginia Beach, Virginia. We're gonna pause for a second. Sure. Okay, so you get selected for the F-18 and you do a couple of tours, I guess. You were in Operation Iraqi Freedom uh, and then you get uh, selected to be a Top Gun instructor. Now, tell us about your first uh, experience and deployments. And then how does one become a instructor at Top Gun? Sure. So uh, like you mentioned, I had one tour of duty as an F-18 pilot before becoming a Top Gun instructor. Um, I started off in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Um, that's where my first tour of duty was. And as part of that, uh, I was a pilot for a squadron called uh, Strike Fighter Squadron 131. Those are the Wildcats. Uh, we were part of Carrier Air Wing 7, and we deployed on board the USS George Washington, a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. And we went around the world, went over to the Persian Gulf, and that's when we operated in Operation Iraqi Freedom. So did that for about seven months. Um, at the conclusion of that tour of duty, which was about two and a half years long, I had applied for and uh, to be a Top Gun instructor, or and more importantly, to be a Top Gun student. And one of the things you get to do when you're applying to Top Gun is you get to accomplish a rush ride. And so essentially you're um, applying to be a student and then you're also showing the current Top Gun staff uh, what, you know, what are your skills? Uh, how good are you in the aircraft? And so I had a chance to dogfight one of the more senior Top Gun instructors, uh, did fairly well overall, um, and, and got asked to become an instructor as well. So that's that was my point of entry into Top Gun. So I, I, I got to put you on the spot. Uh, call signs, not Maverick, uh, you know, <laughs> usually call signs are, are uh, a little bit more embarrassing, but certainly give a window into the individual's soul. So you can decline and uh, if, if you so desire, but you know. Well, sure no, I mean, it's fine. Mike, my, my call sign is BUS, B-U-S. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, it is funny because a lot of times, you know, the original Top Gun movie romanticized call signs. You got Maverick, you got Goose, you got Hollywood and Wolfman, you know, funny. Fun Iceman, all it, that stuff. Yeah, and in real life, you really don't have, uh, typically you've got, uh, like you said, a call sign based off your last name or based off something you did. One of my favorite call signs, there was a Blue Angel pilot I was friends with. His name is Ted Steelman, and his call sign was Bunza, as in Buns of Steelman. Um, so that was always a fun <laughs> one. And then we had another guy in my squadron um, who's Chris Yates, and his call sign was Cuss because he got stuck on the on the top of the aircraft carrier inside of his jet, um, very angry about a situation, and he and he didn't realize his radio was stuck on, and he's just cursing up a storm. So his call sign forever in a day became cuss. So, uh, you know, you can get one, like you said, a variety of ways. There's another uh, uh, a Top Gun instructor right now who uh, bald as a cue ball. I met him and his nickname was Curly. So, yep. uh, so uh, anyway, well, fantastic. So, so as a Top Gun instructor, 
I mean, the movie is inspired, obviously, by the Naval Fighter Weapons School. Is that, that the right, the, the correct name for it? Yes, the U.S. Navy Fighter Weapons School. That's right. Okay. And so, so that inspires the movie. But uh, uh, Kelly McGillis, you know, uh, notwithstanding, how well did the original movie uh, uh, prepare you for your expectations when you walked in the front door? <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, far less beach volleyball in a real Top Gun school than you saw in the movie. But, um, you know, th like you said, there, there are some elements that bear resemblance to reality. A lot of the flying scenes from the movie were actually filmed with Top Gun and Top Gun pilots and, and you know, instructors. So a lot of that stuff is very real from the original movie. And, and my understanding, especially Top, Top Gun helped with the second movie. Of course, the movie itself is already produced and complete. They're just waiting to release it. Those scenes were also filmed with the help of the U.S. Navy and Top Gun. So I expect you'll see a lot of realism in the next movie as well. I mean, of course, the plot and stuff like the first movie will, will be its own uh, separate beast. But uh, yeah, I mean, as far as Top Gun itself, it's, it's a very professional organization. I think that part wasn't necessarily a surprise. As a naval aviator, I knew this. But, uh, but if you do a flyby of the tower, uh, yeah. how much of an ass chewing are you really going to get? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's going to be as much of an attitude and you're just not going to fly for a while because they will ground you. So, uh, you know, th that's called flat hatting um, when you do stuff that's just completely showboating. And so there's much less of an appetite now for flat hatting than there were, say, in the 1980s and 1990s. So you see uh, a lot less of it, but there's still some fun to be had. That's for sure. Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, you come back, you, you go to the Naval War College uh, and you have the opportunity to command Right. Yeah, sure do. So like you mentioned, I had come back uh, from my, so after Top Gun, I went to become a, what they call training officer and a department head. That's kind of middle management inside of a fighter squadron over in Japan. So that was a great experience living in Japan for three and a half years. After that, I went to the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, picked up my third master's degree there. And then because of just the experience and the exposure that I had received at the War College, I got asked to be a uh, speechwriter for the very first time for the head of the US Navy, the gentleman, uh, his title is the Chief of Naval Operations. So this is a four-star admiral who runs the uh, uniform portion of the US Navy. So that was a great experience. You get to see the entirety of the Navy, you get to travel around the country, learn a lot more about uh, not just naval aviation, of course, but everything the Navy's doing working with White House and Congress. Uh, and then at the conclusion of that, you know, kind of a, a finishing school, if you will, for senior leadership, I got a chance to go be a squadron commander of my own command back in Japan for the second time for about two and a half years. It was a squadron called the Dam Busters, Strike mm -hmm. Fighter Squadron 195. And it was just a, a great tour, had about 240 sailors, really amazing men and women from around our country who felt, you know, called to serve and were over in Japan with me. We had a blast, uh, took the squadron, made it the number one in the U.S. Navy and really, really enjoyed that tour. Then you then you get to be a speechwriter for Secretary Mattis. And I have one question that I am sure everybody wants to know the answer. What flavor of crayons did he prefer? <laughs> yeah. Is you that know, is that classified information perhaps? Yeah, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't give away all of Madison's secrets. That's for sure. Did you write the bit about, uh, you know, what keeps you up at night? Nothing keeps me up at night. I keep other people up at night. Did you come up with that one or no? That was, that that one was on his own? I tell you what, that was a great interview, and uh, I've seen so many memes around the internet where he says something like that. And you've got, you know, tigers jumping out of the walls and stuff. I mean, it's that was a really good line that he used on CBS. That is good. So, um, well, let's let's talk a little bit now. Did, quick question: how did, how did you discover, or who discovered that you were so uh, talented at writing? Um, you know, I think it's like a lot of things in our lives, right? It's fate and timing. I mean, just stuff kind of sometimes opportunities knock, and I guess you're either ready to open the door or not. I happened to be at the Naval War College. I did well. I won a few writing awards. And just because of the timing involved, uh, come to find out the chief of naval operations, that leader for the Navy, had uh, found himself in a position where he needed to bring on a new speechwriter real quickly. And so they, they had had luck previously with speechwriters from the Naval War College, people who had just recently gone through. 
And so my name got thrown into the ring. Uh, I was one of about eight candidates from around the, the entire Navy who got asked to apply. And I interviewed and uh, he, he, I guess, liked the cut of my jib. So he brought me in and I spent about a year, maybe a little bit more than a year writing for him. And, you know, it really was the War College that developed the ability to, to write. There was a professor named Donna Connolly. Talk about the impact you can make, the positive impact you can make in other people's lives. She ran the writing center at the War College and she took a lot of time just to help me become a better writer. And so I would say that, you know, a lot of times you can point back at someone who made a significant difference and Donna did to help me become a better writer. And that in turn helped me become a speech writer. So we're talking with Guy Snodgrass. He's the author of Top Gun's Top 10 Leadership Lessons from the Cockpit. Digging in a little bit deeper on the, the, the writing side, when you're a speech writer for the CNO or the Secretary of Defense, do you have a team of researchers that are kind of helping you do this or were you doing it all by yourself? And you're, you're, you know, you're preparing a speech, they're going somewhere and you wanna have some, some topical uh, information. You're just not taking the same material and repurposing it over and over again. You, you're crafting specific stories and data and so forth who helps you pull all of that together yeah i think you know it's in some respects it's yes and no yes you are crafting his speech um you know by yourself because one of the jobs of a speechwriter is to is to know your boss's voice um so i had you know my my team and i we had watched of course hundreds of hours of mattis's prior speeches things that he likes to use all the time, right? Uh, like most of us, you know, there's sayings and other things that we really like to use uh, to become your calling cards as a, as a public speaker. And so some of those elements we'd use fairly repetitiously. But to your point, I mean, when you're the, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon and the military, I mean, you're, it's 3 million people. Uh, it's spread around the world. And so, yes, you, there's an embarrassment of riches that if you were going to be giving a particular speech, like when we would fly to Brussels, Belgium, and he would give a speech to NATO, we had a team inside the Pentagon that focused on only NATO issues. And so a month or so prior, I would start working with that team and asking them to produce talking points and say, look, you know, what are the most important things that from a policy standpoint, you need the Secretary of Defense to say publicly in Brussels to be able to help the United States accomplish the mission that we want to you know, achieve. So, and in, in a lot of cases, you know, one of the biggest elements we were always emphasizing was President Trump's call for NATO to, you know, take their own side in the fight, to invest right. more in their own national defense for all the member nations. And so that's something we'd work in. And then, of course, we'd tailor it so that it sounded like, you know, quintessential Mattis. Sounds like you got a lot of travel involved in the, in the job as well. So you were following the secretary around all the time as well. So let's jump into your book. Uh, uh, fascinating book, Top Gun's Top 10 Leadership Lessons from the Cockpit. Before we talk about a couple of the specific chapters in the book, how did you come up with the concept? What was sort of the genesis of, of uh, this uh, that led you to want to write a book? Yeah, you, you know, I think that as we go throughout our careers, as you interface and, and talk with really interesting people, you know, it, it you kind of flag that in your mind. And I remember when I walked into Top Gun thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is such a storied institution. Like you said, there's a, there's a movie that's incredibly popular about it. Um, you're dealing with some of the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps' best aviators. And so as I was there, uh, not only as a student, but as an instructor, you just kind of realize, man, these are some of the really just people, they, they've got great lessons to teach. And so you're kind of soaking it up like a sponge and I didn't decide, you know, I'm going to write a book about it then. It was just something that as I look back on my career, like you said, I mean, leading a fighter squadron, serving in combat, being in the White House and in the Pentagon, traveling the world, um, I realized pretty quickly that a lot of those foundational tenets that I had learned, you know, as a, as a Boy Scout growing up, that, that my parents had taught me and my community had taught me, were, were amplified at Top Gun. And then all of those lessons remain true throughout the remainder of my career. And I'm watching whether it's the president or vice president or cabinet secretaries. And I'm saying to myself, they have the same, a lot of times attributes that I learned at Top Gun. So there's something to these. They've been proven out across a wide variety of jobs. Uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun to write a book that not only shares real interesting anecdotes and stories about what it was like to be a fighter pilot, but then also at the end of each one of those chapters to tie in a lesson that could apply to anybody 
from all, all walks of life, not just, you know, from a, from a military perspective. One other question, because I'm kind of curious, you know, when, when you uh, go to eat the elephant, you know, you got to eat it one spoonful at a time, right? I mean, did you sort of put together a chapter at a time or had you sort of outlined it conceptually and then went and filled it in or how did it all mm -hmm. kind of come together? I think, you know, I, I had a conceptual outline. And in fact, that's kind of my process. I don't like to write, um, you know, my wife, for example, when um, she's not a professional writer, but when she writes, she likes to just kind of almost like uh, free association, right? You just start writing and then mm -hmm. you'll over time coalesce into a story. Whereas for me, I like to think about it for a long period of time. But then once I solidify it in my mind, it's very easy to write it. When I'd been a squadron commander, I had created a list of 10 axioms. I call them my leadership axioms. And these were, you know, a lot of what you see in the book were the same leadership lessons that I shared with my, with my squadron. And so I said, hey, you know, we want to go from being one of the worst squadrons in the Navy, and we want to turn this around. And in, in the next two and a half years, we want to become one of the best squadrons, if not the best squadron in the Navy. Here's how we're going to do that. These are some of the elements that we all need to embrace. So I had the list of a lot of them. I kind of tweaked them for the book. And then uh, started, you know, you can't just publish a list of 10 things. You've got to actually put the stories to it. So you got to have that. some meat on it, right? Exactly. You want some meat on those bones. So I started thinking back to my time as a Top Gun instructor. What are some really fun flying stories or other stories that I could tell that would help bring the reader in, right? So if you're, if it's your son, who's a relatively new naval aviator, or if it's a high school student, or if it's someone who's kind of maybe already been through a career, but is still looking to kind of keep their leadership perspective fresh, what kind of stories could I share that all variety of Americans could could really enjoy? And so that's that's kind of how I paired it together. It's very interesting. You know, stories are a great way to teach and and for people to learn and for you to mentor people. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think all military veterans have baked into them are certain characteristics: team player. Uh, you know, the ability to communicate, ability to plan, focus on a mission. One of the mm -hmm. things that, that I think is a, is a key trait and, and helps veterans be successful around the world is the ability to remain calm in stressful situations. You have a chapter about staying calm under pressure. Let's talk right. about that. Yeah, this is, a, this is one that I saw not only as a fighter pilot, as you could imagine, right? You have to stay calm under pressure. Like you said, I mean, almost anybody wearing the uniform, especially if you're going into combat, you can't allow your emotions to outrun the situation. And in fact, one of my favorite sayings is that emotion is the enemy of good judgment, right? So if you get caught up in the situation, if you get too emotional about it, you start making pretty bad decisions. So you got to stay calm. So I wanted to pair this up with a, a story that I think really typified what I meant. And, and so what I share is when I was still a relatively new fighter pilot, I had been flying the FA-18, the Hornet, uh, as a student for only a, about two to three months in Lemoore, California. I'm launching airborne. My wingman is an instructor pilot, and we're going to go over the, the deserts of California to do some dogfighting and do some more training. And we're in the middle of a dogfight. My instructor, of course, who has a lot more experience, is doing very well He's pulling in behind me to take a shot, and suddenly I feel a big thump in the aircraft. And at the exact same time, the announcement in my helmet, right, the speaker of my helmet, is that I have an engine fire on the right-hand side. Mm. Uh, and so the first thing you're going to do is assess the situation. I look down, and I re recognize that the engine instruments are telling me that my right engine has gone from 100% full thrust and afterburner to zero in just under a second, right? So, I mean, you're thinking about an engine spinning at over 10,000 RPM and it just seized. So something is catastrophically mm. wrong with the jet and now you fall back on that training, right? So in the Navy, one of the things we teach are three critical steps in any situation is that you at aviate, you navigate, and then you communicate. That's the, that's the lowest priority. So you aviate, meaning you fly the aircraft, you make sure you maintain control, uh, you keep everyone safe, including yourself. You navigate so you can get safely to your destination and make sure you don't, of course, crash into anything. And then you communicate, uh, telling other people what's going on. So those you know, steps definitely saved my life. They also helped make sure that I was able to save the aircraft. My instructor helped me out. We, we both go through what we have. It's called a pocket checklist. It's essentially uh, you know, kind of like your guidebook to the airplane. It's like your small version of your owner's manual that you keep in your helmet bag. 
And so you always fly with it. So we both pull it out. He's helping me from his aircraft. We're troubleshooting step by step to make sure we don't miss anything. Identify that the, the right engine had indeed had a fire. We shut it, I shut it down. And then I have to divert to an air base in California called China Lake mm -hmm. uh, to, to find a closest runway to land on. So long story short, we I land the aircraft. My instructor actually flies back to Lemoore. So I'm by myself. The fire trucks have come out. And then after my jet stops, they hose down the right side of the aircraft with foam. There's no chance of a fire. Everything's starting to dry off. And I asked the firefighter who had come out if I could just climb inside the intake, because normally we would do that prior to flight just to check the jet, make sure everything's okay in the engine. There's no foreign objects that could cause damage. He said, sure. And so I, I used my fingers to start turning the fan blades of that engine. And it sounded like someone had dumped a can of marbles into the intake of that engine. It's rattling. I mean, it's making very abnormal sounds. It turns about a quarter turn. The engine seizes and it would never move again. It's just done. Uh, come to find out about a, two or three weeks later when they had done the teardown of that engine, they found out that someone who had been a mechanic had taken the engine apart to service it. That's all normal. But unfortunately, what's not normal is they left a, a rag in the engine. Oh my goodness. It pulled into the oil sump. It caused a catastrophic overpressure blew the oil from the engine all the way up the right side of the aircraft while I was in that dogfight. Because there's no oil, it seized. It caused the titanium bolts to melt. I mean, it was just a, a mess. But again, from all that, what I learned very early in my career as a, as a very junior fighter pilot was just the importance of staying calm under pressure. You don't let the situation get the best of you. And I love that lesson because as I think about where we are in 2020 with the pandemic, with a lot of uh, still some social unrest around our country, it's just a great reminder to focus on what you can. Don't let other stuff, uh, you know, get you down. Just stay focused and make the best of whatever situation you find yourself in. It's an incredible story, guy. Um, you know, I've heard some of my other aviator buddies say, you know, you can never have enough altitude, enough fuel, enough runway, right? Right. Uh, and sort of, they, you know, puts the stick forward, the houses get bigger, pull them back, they get smaller. You know, there's sort of a little <laughs> bit of a, of a humor to that. But that sounds like a real life and death situation where I guess you kind of, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about a couple of things. I mean, how do you how do you um, how do you physically stay calm in a situation like that? I mean, are you controlling your breathing? You know, mm -hmm. slow is smooth, smooth is fast. What what? Oh yeah. I mean, I mean you, they teach you how to dr to breathe and do the hick maneuver and so forth when you're doing a high G turn. But what do they do? They actually train you to how to keep your body calm so that you can be clear headed in a situation like that. I, you know, I've never been given formal training on staying calm. And by the way, I love the saying you were just alluding to. I learned it from a Navy SEAL friend of mine where he, he said that the teams a lot of times would discuss the fact that slow is steady, steady is smooth. And if you stay smooth, then that becomes fast, right? So just by being slow, you can actually be uh, faster and, and better at your job. So um, I never received formal training, but that's one of the things that I loved about my military experience is that um, you kind of realized after a while that things will never go perfectly. You know, General Eisenhower was known for having a great saying, which was plans are worthless, but planning is indispensable. And so it wasn't that you had a plan. I mean, those are always going to change as soon as something in the situation changes. But the fact that you knew how to be a really good planner meant you could adapt, you were resilient. And so the same thing here, when you realize, hey, you're flying a high performance fighter jet, you're going 600 miles an hour, things are going to happen. So uh, again, emotion is the enemy of good judgment. So if you let yourself get carried away, you're going to respond too fast and you're going to make a, a catastrophic mistake. So you just learn pretty quickly. I think that you just kind of, uh, and I do this in my daily life, even today, you know, uh, where someone comes in with an announcement and they're, and they're almost hyperventilating about it because they're just so excited about it. And you just kind of say, Hey, thanks for the information. Kind of like I was at the beginning of this uh, this podcast to have you on <laughs> hyperventilating, you know. It's the other the other lesson I think is there's no unimportant job in the military. I mean that guy that that left a rag sitting in that engine, you know. There's no unimportant jobs in the military. Another title uh, chapter title: Never wait to make a difference. Let's talk about yeah. that. Sure. And I'm going to, I'm going to put a pen in that for 10 seconds and just say, I love what you just said. I hadn't d addressed it specifically, but I do want to make sure that I, I foot stomp what you just mentioned, which is you've got so many amazing men and women doing a lot of jobs. There are no inconsequential jobs in the military. 
Um, and I think the, the aircraft carrier and a fighter squadron is a great example for this, right? Because if you think about an aircraft carrier, you've got about 45 to 50 aircraft on this massive piece of amazing American machinery, but you've got 4,500 sailors. And they're all there to make sure that the aircraft carrier can go where it needs to, to support American interests. And my squadron, for example, 240 sailors were there just to make sure 12 aircraft and, and the pilots were, were set and ready to go to be able to get airborne at a moment's notice and do their job. So I love that sense of teamwork and the fact that everyone pulls together to make that job go. And you could be fixing an engine, you could be the plane captain, making sure that the plane is prepped and ready to go everyone's pulling in the same direction. And that's something that I think is one of the most magnificent aspects of a military career. Uh, to your point about, you know, never wait to make a difference. Uh, I, this became very important to me because I watched throughout my career, there was just this very unfortunate set of circumstances where I think because the military is a big hierarchy, right? It's like a big corporation. And a lot of times you just kind of have this feeling and perspective that, um, you know, if I'm a junior officer or if I'm a junior sailor uh, on the enlisted side and, and I've got this great idea, something that could really make a difference and, and do well, but I'm not senior enough. I haven't, I haven't reached a high enough rank to where I feel comfortable putting this idea forward. So I'm gonna wait, I'm not gonna share it yet, but man, five or 10 years from now, when I'm in charge, things are gonna change and I'm gonna make a difference. And subsequently they don't get that chance. And so for whatever reason, they either decide to leave the military or, uh, they don't get the promotion that they had hoped for. And so those great ideas that they had and truly some really magnificent ideas just kind of fall by the wayside. And so again, that's why this lesson was born from my time as a Top Gun instructor because Top Gun is so unique because it's not a bunch of senior leaders running around making decisions. We're talking Navy lieutenants, Marine Corps captains, people who are in the very front side of their military careers, but you're just very well trained. And so you have a lot of responsibility for controlling how the Navy and Marine Corps as an as two organizations operate, right? And so it taught me at a very young age, the importance of saying, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to make a difference now. If I've got a great idea, I'm going to propose it. The worst thing that can happen is someone says no, but typically you find that the organization loves it. They'll help you out. They'll help make that idea, turn it into a, a reality. And then now you're benefiting those around you. And, and so I loved watching people who are willing to innovate and who never waited to make a difference. Uh, you know, you this this quote reminds me of another guest I've had on the podcast, a guy named Brian Muka, and he has a quote. I'm going to mess it up, but he basically says the most valuable real estate in the world is the graveyard because in it are buried all the new businesses and new ideas and books and so forth that you know where people said I'm going to get around to that someday. And I think it's kind of right. a, has a parallel to what to what you're saying there. As a commander, you know, you go into become a squadron commander and it's a three year roughly uh, uh, job. Uh, how did you try to convey that specific piece of culture to the people in your squadron? What did you do as a leader and a commander that encouraged that that this the lowest ranking ranking man or woman in your in your squadron to 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 come out with these ideas to help improve to not wait to make a difference. How'd you do that? Well, I think there's a, a few ways. One of the things that I was adamant about the entirety of my time, and I think it is somewhat unique, was I always referred to my squadron as a family as opposed to you know a job. We when you think about it, we were fairly unique. We're stationed in Japan. You are away, especially these junior sailors are away from their families here back stateside. So you really have to pull together. And so we would do a lot of fun things. We would decorate their barracks doors for Christmas. You know, we'd wrap them in paper. We'd host a Thanksgiving feast. You know, my wife and other sailors, uh, you know, the senior leaders in the command would, would serve the sailors, right? So it was all about servant leadership and making sure that you broke down a lot of those barriers to say, uh, I may be the most senior person in this command, but doesn't mean I have a lock on all the good ideas. In fact, uh, I know for a fact, I don't have all the good ideas, you do. And so I need you to bring those forward. And so, you know, you just, I think it's one of those things you can say it early on, which I did, uh, but then you reinforce it through your actions, right? And that's something that I also learned throughout my, my career was that your actions will always speak far louder than your words ever can. So you can, you can set up front in the early days and weeks of your tenure what you care about and how you want your organization to behave. And then you reinforce that through your actions consistently. And, and I would always find ways to reward, you know, if a sailor came up with even just a really small idea, but 
uh, it was a solid idea. I'd make sure I'd recognize them publicly in front of the squadron. I'd give them a, a, a command coin, right? So a lot of times commanding officers have these metallic, what we call challenge coins. So I'd bring them up and I'd put their picture up on a, on a big, uh, you know, uh, the screen where I was doing my slideshow. And I'd, and I'd say, hey, great idea. We're using this. Way to go to, you know, Seaman Timmy for, for proposing this idea. And, and you'd find that because you're, you're rewarding the right kind of behavior, other people would start to follow suit. And so it was just a really great way to get other sailors inspired to want to have uh, a piece of the squadron's success. And we're talking with Guy Snodgrass, Naval Academy grad and author. You know, something you brought up, um, you know, and, and, I, and I want to drill down on it a little bit. I mean, you actually did some turnaround management, I guess, in the sense that you took a squadron that was, you, you said maybe was the worst to the best. Is that, uh, or at least in in the in the in the bottom to the top? Right. Yeah. Uh, so you're a little bit of a turnaround manager too, huh? How was that process? Is that is that something that you've got a skill for or a passion for? Did you get a uh, reputation for that? Um, you know, I think you know if I've got any kind of a skill for it, it's because I was around some great leaders and I got to observe how they operated. And, and so you kind of always over time absorb some of those lessons, what you think works and what doesn't work. But yes, absolutely, there's a passion for it. I mean, when you think about, uh, that's the nature of Top Gun. You walk in, you assume a lecture area, you become the subject matter expert for something. In my case, it was uh, you know, aerial warfare, aerial combat. And so you take it from wherever the instructor had left it and then you make it better. And in fact, my father and other leaders had taught me that once again, as a Boy Scout, you know, we always had this saying, you leave the campsite better than you found it. So I think that that's just a perennial uh, ideal we should all strive for, no matter what organization, what type of company you're part of or community, you know, you can always find ways to make it better each and every day. In fact, one of the sayings I use in the book is that uh, Top Gun instilled this, this desire in me that no matter where you are, you know, you make today better than yesterday, and then you do the same thing tomorrow. So it's just a continual process of trying to uh, always strive to make things around you better. So, you know, when you talk about turning an organization around, yes, absolutely. It, it had been perennially ranked very low in the air wing. You know, there's typically eight squadrons in an air wing. This, squ this particular squadron that I inherited was always ranked somewhere six, seven, or eight. Mm -hmm. Had never performed at the top. Uh, and I was very lucky. The, my predecessor, the commanding officer in front of me, I was friends with him. I'd known him for about 15 years. We talked a year and a half before I even showed up about what kind of squadron we wanted to create how we were going to work cooperatively together to help make that happen and, and to turn things around. And, you know, I think there's a lot of times you can't guarantee success in life. That's pretty much impossible, but you can design ways to be successful. And so I think that that was very helpful to have a lot of cooperation, a lot of people who really wanted to, to pursue it. And, and it's like a winning sports team, right? I mean, as soon as you start seeing that things are improving, everyone's morale is starting Nothing to Nothing succeeds like success, right? Absolutely. You know, it's infectious. And so the other sailors, all the sailors in the squadron started really getting on board. And, and it was, it was a lot of fun to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's fantastic. So, um, gosh, you know, I think the Navy lost an awesome leader when you decided to retire. <laughs> I'm just sitting here going, gosh, I wish I had been under your command. I mean, I ah. just really like your style. I can tell. I don't know, though. I bet you I bet you had to sharpen your teeth every now and then. You could probably give somebody an ass chewing. But uh, so so what <laughs> what's your passion now? What's what what's uh, you know, what's what have you got looking? You know, what are you looking forward to now? Yeah, I think that's, you know, what's been fun is uh, I sprinted for another two years after my retirement. I retired in the fall of 2018. So I'm basically at that two year mark now. Um, started my own consulting company called Defense Analytics. I've been running on that for two years, really enjoying the opportunity to work with a lot of these different companies because... And what, what do you do in defense analytics? Just Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it varies. Like you mentioned, one of the skill sets military members are really good at is strategic planning. And a lot of times you find that, especially for these large companies, right, you know, what they call multinational corporations, um, they've got a lot of operations going, they're involved with countries around the world, but from kind of the upper echelon of management, it, it, there's just people focused on each individual task, but no one's really steering the ship from a very high level perspective. So that's been fun for me. These companies will invite me in, ask me to, to, to help out. One of the things I'm, I'm kind of have some expertise in because of my computer science degrees is artificial intelligence. Mm 
Mm. Uh, that's an area where there's a lot of interest right now. So in particular, I'll go in and help chart the path for how they develop their artificial intelligence capabilities. But also, since I had those opportunities as a speechwriter and, and communications director, uh, I'm also helping them with their strategic communications plans. You know, so you can do these, this great work, but if you can't share that with the public, you know, you're losing an opportunity. So it's kind of across the board. I've enjoyed that. And then, like you mentioned, you know, I've, I wrote two books within the span of a year. And so I'm kind of at the phase now where I'm, I'm kind of casting a wide net. I want to see where my passion lies next and, and uh, probably still have a few more books left in me. Have you got another title in mind or at least a theme? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, uh, I'm not ready to share it yet, but there's, you know, like I said, I, I, I really, I've always had a fascination with technology. I was uh, a kid who loved computers. I actually loved programming and stuff. Uh, of course, I have a, a deep background in national security and, and, and defense specifically. And so I think there's going to be a fun book to talk about kind of how the U.S. military is completely changing the game right now to become more tech oriented. Um, so you're getting away from a lot of the tanks and the planes and you're going more towards what technology can do for you, especially now that we're competing more with Russia, China and other nations. Uh, some of my friends have described me as a uh, speech seeking a podium. Uh, you, you, uh, are you doing some speaking out there? Uh, yeah, sure, yeah, when we get, I mean, I guess a lot of it is remote now, but uh, uh, you know, what kind of speaking opportunities are you seeking? Uh, yeah, no, I'm glad you asked because yes, absolutely. I've been doing public speaking. I do enjoy it much like yourself. Uh, so if there's any of your listeners who are looking for a speaker would love to seek out that opportunity, but yeah, it's, it's, it's run the gamut. I've, uh, was really honored. MIT had asked me to, to speak. They've got a uh, annual symposium they do for chief information officers. So I spoke about leadership during times of crisis. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I've had private companies who've asked me to come in and basically relate some of the lessons like I do in the book from Top Gun uh, to how I can tailor that to everybody from you know electricians, if they're a company that does uh, high voltage AC, for example, all the way to um, newly promoted managers and senior leaders for a corporation. And I'm um, also got some coming up with some of the New York uh, financial firms. So I've really enjoyed that. Uh, and I think some of my favorites, of course, like I just got asked by the Boy Scouts of America, I did their national youth leadership uh, conference. And so it was great to be able to say, um, you know, in that case, hey, leaders are, I think, made. I mean, obviously, there are some fundamental attributes we all have that can help us be a better leader. But you can develop those skill sets over time. And I'm living proof of someone who was a really shy high schooler, had the chance to go to the military. I took that opportunity and because of that, turned into a much better, I think, leader than I would have been if I had not been in military service. I've got a, uh, just in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking, I need to get you to Lexington, Virginia, get you to come talk and, and talk about your book to the cadets at VMI. and, oh, and yes. uh, uh, you know, they have a leadership and ethics center there in the Marshall, uh, George C. Marshall uh, Foundation and building and so forth. And uh, I just think you've got a lot of wonderful lessons that uh, that that you could share. I'm also, you know, really interested in, you know, the next book you're going to write. Uh, just, you know, sounds like that's where your passion is. And, um, you know, just really looking forward to all of that. Let me, you know, I've asked this question to a couple of folks, I guess, um, and, and we'll use this to kind of to wrap up our conversation. But if you could go back and talk to, you know, young Ensign uh, Snodgrass here and uh, and give him one or two pieces of advice. I like to say it takes 20 years to get 20 years of experience, but, you know, other than buy Apple stock, I mean, if you got something <laughs> that you would go back and tell your younger self, you know, hey, you know, the sooner you figure this out, the better off you'll be. No, I mean, frankly, you teed up a great pitch. Uh, I would honestly take the Top Gun's top 10 book and I would just hand it to my younger self and say, look, this is a culmination of decades of not only my own personal experience, but being in a position to work directly with very senior leaders around our country and around the world, seeing how they operate, seeing what the common traits for very successful people looks like. So, um, you know, one of the other chapters in the book that we didn't get a chance to talk about is nothing worthwhile is ever easy, but guess what? That's just a reality in life. You have to choose to want to be successful. I hope you're willing to take up that, that calling. So here's a book, read these 10 lessons, think about them deeply and how you want to apply them 
in your own life. And I'd feel very comfortable with that because like I said, the, the approach was to tell 10 really fascinating stories that draw you in because they're exciting and fun. But at the, at the end of each story, there's that lesson that helps you take away why that lesson became important and what it did for me, you know, in the succeeding decades. So that's, that, that's where I would start. Well, uh, folks, we've been talking to Guy Snodgrass. Again, he's the author of Top Gun's Top 10 Leadership Lessons from the Cockpit. Probably ought to be required reading for all the ensigns going through uh, uh, API at, uh, at uh, Pensacola there, right? Um, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for stepping into the spotlight. Yeah, thanks, Bob. It was great talking to you. I really enjoyed the conversation, and thanks for what you're doing for the veteran community. Thanks very much. You've been listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. We air on Tuesdays and Fridays, and we bring individuals and veterans who are making a difference in our community. Uh, we are available on all your favorite podcast channels, and we're trying to get more followers on our YouTube channel where you can see me and Todd and our smiling faces. So uh, appreciate you being in a little army thing here. Bravo Zulu to you, Todd, and, 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 uh, guy, and, and that's a wrap.